Now that's quite a big difference from what the uh, IPC said its computer models say. Why might we have this big difference? And unless there's some evidence, it's well, this is just one method and computer models are much more accurate, therefore we rely upon computer models. Except that in October of 2006, there was a paper published in the Journal of Climate before the IPCC's fourth assessment report came out, this paper by uh, Held and Soden, pointing out that in the computer models used by the IPCC for its fourth assessment report, the evaporation rate increase with temperature was only about one third of what one would expect it to be under the clausius clapeyron relationship. So if one has only one third, what we're doing is we're reducing this value here by a large factor to that two, uh, and R then becomes larger, the amplification becomes larger. In fact, there was another paper came out in science, published in Science in uh, July of 2007, after the IPCC report, which did two things. It confirmed that the computer models used by the IPCC underestimated the, radio, the rate of evaporation increase, but it also said, or confirmed, that based on satellite information over the last 20 years with the surface temperature increasing of the Earth, that also precipitation had increased. And that the rate of increase of precipitation and evaporation, because they, they're linked, was according to the clausius clapeyron relationship. So I went to these colleagues, they said, well, instead of these uh, predictions of uh, warmer temperatures and more droughts, we're going to have warmer temperatures and more rainfall. They didn't tweak to the fact that evaporating uh, water vapour from the ocean is in fact going to take heat out of the ocean and constrain the, the warming. So if one puts the values that, uh, that uh, Wentz and uh, Heldon Soden uh, uh, found from the computer models back into this little formula, what we find is that uh, uh, we're not going to be about the evaporation and we can quite easily get temperature projections of greater than two degrees, only because of the underspecification of evaporation in the computer models. They've tuned their models so that the average evaporation from the, the surface is, uh, is okay, but what they haven't got is the rate of increase. And it's the rate of increase which is the, the thing that's going to constrain the temperature. And some computer models, they grossly underestimate the evaporation. Almost no increase at all, and they border on computational instability. That value of R is approaching 1, and so their, their model's getting warmer and warmer and warmer. They say, well, this is runaway global warming. Uh, somebody who knows a bit more about it might say, well, it's computational instability on the verge of. So uh, we're getting the misinterpretation of even what the GCMs are saying. So, I say dangerous global warming, even cause global warming, is an illusion. Increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has little additional radiative forcing on the climate. Computer models don't adequately <coughs> simulate the important energy processes in the, in the climate system. Computer predictions of dangerous anthropogenic global warming are exaggerated, and particularly runaway global warming is physically impossible. People like Sir David King, the advisor, science advisor to Tony Blair, who said, no, by the end of the century, the only place we're going to be able to live is Greenland, is in uh, Antarctica. Complete nonsense. We have this ocean, and if every time you raise that temperature by one degree, you put a lot more energy out of the system. So you've got to find energy, a source of energy, and the back radiation, even the sort of the feedback, is not enough to raise the temperature very much. Just to put a bit of context, and uh, Bob showed uh, part of this slide previously, and look, this one is, is reversed in what is was. Just to point out that uh, from five million years ago, Earth has uh, cooled, it's gone through much stronger gyrations, and the last 500,000 years we saw from the Greenland ice cores, these uh, ice age to uh, interglacial periods. Now, because it's about 100,000 year periodicity here, people say, well, this is related to the orbit of the Earth around the Sun, part of the, uh, the eccentricity effect. And so what we have here on the top 
is the so-called solar forcing of, uh, of the Earth, the uh, solar insulation at 65 north in July, which is supposed to affect the, uh, the ice ages and so forth. It hasn't changed over the five million years, but Earth's temperature certainly has. Not only have you got this 100,000 year uh, periodicity through here, there's the cross section of the equator, or the depth section of the equator, from uh, maybe 140 east, this is about uh, New Guinea, to 800 west, this is just off South America. So we've got a scale here of about 10,000 kilometres. Uh, the vertical scale is 0.5 of a kilometre. So we're looking at sort of the surface layer of the ocean. Underneath this half a kilometre is another three and a half kilometres of very cold water down to near freezing at the, uh, at the surface. What we're seeing here is this very thin lens of warm water, which is what our atmosphere is responding to. But over on the east side, there is upwelling of, and cold water being entrained into the, into the surface layer. And as this entrainment changes from uh, year to year, we know the La Nina and the El Nino. And it has enormous impact upon the climate of the Earth. Now, why should this be stable? We've got two fluids. We've got an atmosphere and an ocean interacting by stress at the surface. We know we've got periodicities on the interannual time scale because of El Nino. We know we've got periodicities in our climate system, things called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the North Atlantic Oscillation, the Arctic Oscillation, the, uh, there's the uh, Southern... Uh, uh, Southern Ocean Oscillation. There's a whole range of oscillations, largely because of the interaction between the atmosphere and the ocean and the energetics of this sort of surface layer. At the time of the last glacial maximum, this relatively warm water over here, which is around 29 degrees centigrade, was only about 3 degrees colder. Now, 3 degrees colder and we go back to the evaporation, the, uh, the clouds and Stoparin relationship. For every one degree temperature rise, you increase the evaporation and the loss of latency by about 7%. So in the last glacial maximum, you had something like 20% less energy going from the oceans into the atmosphere. Now, there's a requirement for large amounts of energy from the, ocean, the tropical oceans to the atmosphere to be transported to the poles to offset the negative radiation loss in the polar regions. If you reduce the the uh, evaporation of latent heat in the, in the tropics, you very quickly cool the polar regions. And so there's a whole lot of interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere that are extremely important for projecting climate. The issue, though, is that we've only started measuring the, ocean, the subsurface ocean currents about five years ago. How is it that computer models can project 100 years in advance without knowing these sorts of interactions. So I guess I'll summarise my talk by saying the climate system is naturally variable on all time scales. Climate extremes are hazardous. We've got to prepare for them. Communities must develop resilience to withstand the hazards of cyclic climate variability and extremes. It's not only drought and flood periods. There's a whole range of, of climate extremes that we must prepare for. Uh, if we drop back into a cooler period, shorter growing seasons and so forth. There are many uncertainties and unknown, unknowns as to the cause of climate variability in long-term change. We should not succumb to mysticism and illusion that we understand what it is and that it's this thing called CO2 that it's all about. It's not about CO2, it's about a whole range of other things. And carbon dioxide <coughs> from modern industry and agriculture is not a pollutant. It has only limited influence on climate, but is beneficial to plant growth through enhancing photosynthesis. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, William Kinloch.